Okay, good afternoon, colleagues, and a very warm welcome back to our conference, our British Journal of Midwifery Virtual Conference for 2021. Um, this is us just returning after lunch. I hope you've had a good, good break there uh, and ready for the afternoon sessions. Um, with some general housekeeping for us, just first of all, uh, just as reminders that we are, we'd be very keen for you to add any questions that you might have uh, for our speakers this afternoon, and you can add them to the Q&A tab. Um, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. We are recording the sessions and they'll be available on demand after the conference for you to view again. We'll be making sure that CPD certificates are emailed directly to you within a month of the conference. And we'll be really grateful if you could provide any feedback on the form that's emailed to you uh, following each of the days. Um, so that'll come at the end of today. So really delighted to have Alison Pearson with us, uh, a mum of a trisomy 18 child and uh, a works within the SOFT uh, UK uh, support group network for trisomy 13 and trisomy 18 and she's going to give us a presentation this afternoon on a parent's experience of trisomy 18. So enjoy and over to you Alison. Thank you, thank you. Um, so thank you very much for um, uh, for joining my session today. Um, so just a little bit um, about who I am. Um, I'm speaking with, with two hats on I guess today. Um, one is a mum of two children, um, Harriet and Isabel. Um, Isabel diagnosed with full trisomy 18. And one as a trustee of Soft UK, um, which is the UK support organisation for trisomies 13 and 18. In terms of what I'm going to um, try and cover this afternoon, um, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about what we know about trisomy 18. Um, but then I'm actually going to put it into context in terms of our pregnancy and birth story, our diagnosis, um, our experience as parents, and, um, and then some of my experiences from soft um, of other trisomy children and some thoughts about um, my take on how midwives could help. So first of all, um, many of you may know this, but just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, um, trisomy 18, which is also um, referred to as Edward syndrome, is um, where there is an extra chromosome on number 18, um, as you'll see in the little diagram highlighted in red. Um, it's the second most common um, trisomy on a numbered chromosome, with Downs being the, um, the first and probably one that everybody's heard about. It can present um, as a full form, um, as shown in the diagram where the full chromosome um, is affected in all cells, the mosaic form where the um, full chromosome is present but not in all cells, or the partial form where it's part of the chromosome. It's often talked about as well um, and alongside Patau syndrome, chromosome 13, even though they're two different syndromes. So as a starting point in terms of what we know or what we think we know, um, I um, got this um, from the NHS current website, um, which basically tells, um, tells everybody, tells new parents um, about Edward syndrome basically um, tells you that it affects how long a baby may survive and that all babies with um, Edward syndrome will have some level of learning disability and different physical features and health problems. There are things, however, that we don't know. And um, this quote came um, pretty early on in our journey um, by our paediatric consultant, who is um, uh, still our consultant now. And I think it's really, really pertinent um, that Edward syndrome is often talked about in terms of statistics. Um, at the time Isabel was born, those statistics were that 5% um, of children would make it to a year of age. Um, our um, wise paediatric consultant um, said this, or words to this effect, I may be slightly misquoting him, but basically statistics can tell you what um, a population will do, but they can't predict what an individual will do. And so this story is um, very much about um, my daughter Isabel. Um, Isabel is now 10, 10 and a bit years old, um, and this is Isabel. So I thought um, as you were midwives, you might be interested in my pregnancy story, but this was very much the calm before the storm. Um, it was really quite uneventful. It was my second pregnancy. Um, I had a low risk at my um, 12 week scan um, and blood tests for Downs, Edwards and Patos. And there was nothing untoward seen or found in the scans. 
until it was around 34 weeks where I had slightly raised um, fluid volumes and so I had some extra scans, but still nothing was raised in those scans. Um, the consultant that I saw at the time um, about the fluid said there was a possibility of esophageal atresia, basically where the esophagus is at a dead end, um, but that wasn't thought to be likely and it was pretty well downplayed. Um, the baby was thought to be small, but not concerningly small. Um, but was, what was most of the concern at that time was that um, she had become in an unstable or transverse lie, depending on when she was scanned. And so um, I was booked in for a planned C-section. Um, basically, because of the high fluid volume, because of the unstable lie, and because I'd had my first child by cesarean section, it's felt this was the, the best option. And then Isabel was born. Um, she was clearly unwell. Um, she was whisked off pretty well straight away to the neonatal unit. And very quickly, she was diagnosed as having a tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, this is basically where the esophagus doesn't connect. The um, uh, esophagus is, is basically at a dead end from the top. Um, and the trachea joins the bottom end um, of the esophagus, um, which basically means that anything from the stomach can potentially go into the lungs, so that, that is a serious condition. It was identified that surgery would be needed um, and that, that surgery would need to take place in, in Bristol, which is about an hour and a half away from where we live. Um, there were some other concerns raised. Um, Isabel was quite small. She was born at four pounds, 13 ounces. Um, there was a concern about whether she might have a problem with her heart. They weren't really sure about that, whether that was the case or not. Um, she was really small, she was quite floppy, there was obviously something not quite right um, and so bloods were taken, we weren't really sure about what those bloods um, were for um, and she had a series of detailed heart scans to see if the, what was thought was a heart problem actually was a heart problem or not. And then in the first few days, um, so um, Isabel was born on um, Tuesday. On the Wednesday, she was transferred to our regional NICU, which was in um, Bristol. Um, when we got there, and for the first few days, actually, there was not much information. Um, a lot was trying to make sure she was stable. Um, a lot was managing her secretions because she her esophagus wasn't joined up. Um, uh, the sort of mouth secretions um, had to be kept being suctioned away. Um, we were waiting for the blood test results. Um, she was jaundiced, as you can see in the picture. Um, she was losing weight, but she was actually pretty alert when she was stable, when she was not having um, a problem with managing her fluid. Um, in terms of um, the, the sort of other part of this story, so I was discharged um, 24 hours um, after having my cesarean section so that I could go with Isabel to Bristol. Um, which meant, um, and my, my husband drove me and um, uh, him up to Bristol, meant we were um, away from home and our three-year-old son, um, my parents had to quickly move in and take over here. Um, and obviously in this period I'm post-C-section, um, because Isabel can't feed, I'm expressing milk to freeze, and I was discharged with no ongoing um, midwife care um, in place at all. In fact, I only found um, the midwives at the hospital when I um, uh, got to Bristol because I couldn't bear on top of all of this my husband having to give me the injections post cesarean section that he'd been shown to do when we left. So our diagnosis experience. Um, so we got the diagnosis of trisomy 18 when Isabel was three days old and, and I've given you a bit of the context of the sort of roller coaster journey we've had at, at this point. Um, many people would get their diagnosis at a different point, maybe in pregnancy or um, maybe even um, uh, just before birth, but ours was at three days um, old. And, and I wanted to try and explain how that felt. And I felt the best way to do this was just show you some of the words that come to mind when I still think of that experience now. Um, it was pretty horrific. I have to say it was really, really scary. Um, it was really quite shocking. Um, it was like actually having some kind of physical shock. Um, it was it was quite brutal um, in, in hearing this news. Um, we'd already got a level of worry about this surgery that was needed and about what was wrong, but nobody had alerted us to the fact that something so catastrophically wrong might be um, going on. So it was pretty um, horrific. Having spoken to other parents who've had a diagnosis, 
these feelings would be pretty common um, to those wherever in their pregnancy journey or their birth journey they, they've, they've had them. Your screen sharing has been disconnected. What we got at our diagnosis at this earth shattering time was lots of information about chromosome. We got pictures of chromosomes and we got um, an explanation about what happened and, and what caused Edward syndrome. We got a very definitive prognosis, which was that the, Isabel would be with us for days or weeks at best. We weren't actually told about the 5% of children who um, make it to a, a, a year at that time. Um, there was an assumption immediately of palliative care. So we were given the number of the, um, the local children's um, hospice and told about palliative care. We didn't even really understand what palliative care meant for a baby. There was a presumption that she would be for do not resuscitate. Um, we actually had to argue quite strongly um, that that was not our wishes. And there was very much a medical and paternalistic framing of the situation. Um, it was very done on a very functional basis, um, done on a very um, matter of fact basis, um, telling us statistics um, about the days or weeks bit, um, talking about her dysmorphic features, um, saying things like not appropriate to resuscitate her. So it was very technical and functional. And the one thing that was definitely um, missing was any kind of hope whatsoever um, in, that, in that story. What we actually needed at our diagnosis was to understand a bit more about the spectrum of possibilities. So um, Edward syndrome very often results in a um, uh, very, very poor prognosis. But actually there are some babies and even at that time there were babies that did better than expected. So we needed to understand a bit more about that. We needed some real compassion and empathy and someone to really sort of try and get in our shoes and understand what that felt like and some really thoughtful language. We needed some more information about how and where to research because um, it's really difficult if you go on a Google search um, for Edward syndrome you come up with all sorts of things and many of them are really really quite grim. We needed someone genuinely to feel on our side. We felt really, really lonely and really abandoned. And bear in mind, we are away from home. This is our, um, uh, the picture here is when our um, son was brought up to visit us. But we were really actually um, uh, on our own pretty much all of the time and, and feeling very much on our own. We needed some help about how to get through the next few days. Um, we really didn't, um, we were so totally thrown and, and, and our earth was so totally blown to bits. We, we really struggled. And we needed at least a little hope, um, a little hope of something. Um, not every time we, we, we were a bit more hopeful about a little bit of progress she'd made or something that was more positive, someone would try very hard to make sure that we were clear that this was not a time to be hopeful. And we definitely needed support for the whole family and the focus was very much on Isabel, which was quite right and proper. She was in a very serious situation, um, but there was no support for um, myself or my husband, Bill, or our, our son, Harry. So I'd like to reflect a bit now in what's happened since then. Um, there have definitely been some stormy seas, and I think this picture pretty well um, uh, exemplifies some of how it's felt. Um, particularly emotionally with that big black cloud hanging over us and particularly in the early days um, is today going to be the day she's going to die um, were the thoughts that went through my mind quite often in those early um, stages where I'm there sort of expressing milk in one hand and looking after a three-year-old in the other and a very complex baby um, when we got home. Uncertainty is really hard, um, really hard. Isabel is and remains medically fragile. So we have had many hospital admissions, um, typically for re respiratory problems. And um, some years that's been um, five or six admissions in a year. So um, we have been in hospital more than we would like to be. Some of that hasn't been easy because of some of the framing in the early days of um, the, the medical response to that. We have had some near miss situations which have been desperately scary. Um, we have been to um, paediatric intensive care. 
we have had a situation where um, Bill, my husband, had to do um, CPR on the bedroom floor while I rang for the ambulance. So we've had some pretty scary situations. And Isabel is significantly disabled. Um, she is 10, but she can't walk. She is making progress in using a walker. Um, she can't talk, although she communicates pretty well everything she needs to. Um, she's quite bossy, but she has got really delayed development. So um, she, is, she is pretty di disabled. The support more widely is variable. So support for education, respite, healthcare. Sometimes it's brilliant and sometimes it's really, really quite hard to get the support we need. And most of the support has needed to be fought for. And it's not a journey that everybody could feel that they could embark on. I'm in no way saying that and suggesting in, in presenting today. However, we have had a lot of adventures. Um, so one of these pictures is in um, Menorca, um, the other is on, oh I don't know, one of our, I think we've had, I think we worked out, we've had seven once in a lifetime trips to Disneyland Paris. Um, it certainly made us seize every moment and um, uh, just live life. And as you can see, um, our life and Isabel's life is full of love and life and experiences and family and doing things and curiosity about the world and, um, and a great deal of happiness. Isabel has a way of radiating joy in a way that I know of no other person. Um, she is quite remarkable in many, many ways. I think it's worth bringing in here at the moment um, that Soft UK um, supports families like us who've had a trisomy 18 or a trisomy 13 diagnosis. And um, so that kind of support um, also extends to, to yourselves as professionals. There's a lot of information and resources, um, particularly via the website, um, including latest research as, as we found it. It's very important um, that parents receive non-judgmental support as they make decisions um, and I'll, I'll come on to decisions in, in a moment. There's a confidential helpline um, for people at any stage of their um, trisomy journey and, and sometimes people ring because they've had a new diagnosis but sometimes people ring many many years after a bereavement. There is the, um, the shared experiences with other people and we're starting to share more information about um, stories, of, um, uh, stories of all sorts of trisomy outcomes. We do a great deal of connecting families together and that's really important. One of the words I used um, in our diagnosis was feeling abandoned and we certainly felt very isolated and lonely. Um, and so the ability to connect with other people um, both hopefully one day again face to face and um, through things like Facebook group are really really important and I think it's worth mentioning that it's support for the whole family so grandparents, siblings, parents um, for however long people and at whatever stage people might want it. I think it's worth talking about decision making um, I think it's really important to recognise that all decisions associated with trisomy 18 and 13 are heartbreakingly hard. So if a diagnosis is received in pregnancy, then there's decisions about continuing with the pregnancy. Um, the decisions about um, if continuing with the pregnancy or if it's um, uh, a late decision about birth plans. Um, there are decisions around active or palliative care and the level of intervention um, that people feel um, appropriate and comfortable with and, and those are all hard there's no good answer um, in them um, or easy solution and even now 10 years on the statistics are still pretty bleak um, they have improved and 13 percent of babies is the, the latest statistic on how many would live to a year um, but the statistics beyond a year are patchy because nobody really has done much of a job of collecting them um, but some of the research I've seen shows that um, once babies get to a year, quite a high proportion of those continue to at least five years. Many parents that I've met on our trisomy journey want to at least meet their baby, even if they know that that's not going to be for very long. But there are no easy answers, and I think every family and every family situation and circumstances is, is, is different. I think even where people have decided they really want to continue with the pregnancy, not all children survive. I think the 
the phrase that people hate more than anything is incompatible with life. I think it's really important um, to be mindful of that. Um, people want their, their baby to count and incompatible with life sounds like a, a way of making that baby not count. And this is just a snapshot of some of the um, uh, the current tries me 18 children um, living in the UK. Um, uh, and um, you'll see, I say children, but actually um, uh, Saskia up in the corner there is 29. Um, but our children are very much compatible with love and with joy. Just a quick note, um, where, where people have a mo mosaic trisomy diagnosis, that's even more complicated because the range of outcomes can be even greater. So mosaic children um, may do much better, but not automatically so. So the range is much, much bigger. I think self-fulfilling prophecies is a really important thing to be mindful of. And these are all things that were said to us, which come with a certain amount of loading in the language. So we were told that we would have been offered a therapeutic termination if Isabel had been diagnosed before she was born. This was actually after she was born. Um, it's a bit loaded, really, to suggest that that termination might have been therapeutic. Um, and then really easy self-fulfilling prophecies, like she'll never manage to coordinate feeding. Well, Isabel actually um, does feed, um, but if we'd have given up at that point, she probably would have never learned how to feed um, and how to um, coordinate feeding. So in terms of how you can help us, um, these were... Um, uh, when I asked um, our little trisomy community um, what they said about midwives who had helped um, them, um, in both cases, these were parents who had um, a diagnosis um, when pregnant um, and decided to continue with the pregnancy. Um, and um, they both have said really what, what a, a lot of what I'd like to say, that the glimmer of hope, the support, the being on our side, the, the lack of judgment and the advocacy. So I think that's really probably my my sort of overriding message is how you can help where, where, wherever and whenever we've received that diagnosis. It's likely to be at, at a point where a midwife is still involved. Be with us on our journey. Listen to us with your heart. And I know that's really difficult that you've got so many competing pressures and so many time demands. And it's really, really a, a, a busy role. But actually... Parents who have this kind of diagnosis need some kind of genuine, heartfelt listening. Help us to understand the options, and that's really difficult. And I think sometimes that might involve needing to do some more research yourself. And, and actually, every trisomy parent that I've met has said that they don't mind when people say they don't know. They'd rather people said they didn't know than say they know with certainty, and then they later find out that that wasn't the truth. I think to find us more information if, if we want it. So not every parent will. Some will make their decisions really easily. Soft is a great place to refer to, especially in these sort of busy and pressured times. There's a, there's a lot of information and support and people who have been through a uh, trisomy experience. And I think now um, signposting to social media support is really valuable. Um, I speak to parents almost daily on, on Facebook who have got some level of um, uh, somewhere on their trisomy journey. And I think it's just really helpful to connect with other people. I think suspend any judgment. I think people worry um, about being judged if they decide to not proceed with a pregnancy normally, but actually in speaking to parents, many feel they've been judged for proceeding with a pregnancy and felt that that has been made clear to them that they um, uh, they shouldn't have been doing that and that they're not acting in, in baby's best interest. I think being mindful of the language used, I think my my examples just there, um, you know, talking about my beautiful daughter as having dysmorphic features, and that wasn't a midwife, I, I hasten to add, but nobody ever said, um, isn't she beautiful? Um, there was just this sort of technical um, dysmorphic features language. And I think remembering mums need special care after birth too. It's easy for the focus to be on baby. Um, but I was there um, really sort of left to my own devices post-C-section um, uh, to go and be transferred to, um, uh, to, to somewhere else outside of my home environment with no ongoing midwife support. And I think more than anything, to help us find hope 
in the dark places that inevitably come with a tris trisomy diagnosis. Um, these, um, uh, this presentation will be um, made available in the handout section, I think, after I stop speaking. But there are various sort of references and, um, uh, and sites on there, including some, um, uh, some, some YouTube videos. Um, so I'd like to um, thank you for listening. I presume you're listening. That's the great thing about an online conference. Um, uh, but thank you for listening. Um, and um, I'll, um, I'll stop sharing in a minute and, and ask for any questions. But just to leave you with that, um, that, that wisdom from our um, paediatrician, that statistics can tell you what happens in a population, but they can never predict how an individual will do. And I think that's very much been our trisomy story. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Alison, for sharing your story, a, a very moving story, but quite an inspiring story as well, hearing about Isabel and your family's adventures uh, and, uh, and life with her over the last 10 years. Um, I think lots of very supportive and, uh, you know, quite striking comments as well from colleagues uh, and delegates who have had similar experiences um, with other conditions, for example, spina bifida, Amelia. Uh, talks about her uh, son who had spina bifida um, and very similar comments made during the pregnancy and, and at times of scans about the diagnosis and, and recommendations to terminate but as she uh, says you know he's everything uh, we ever imagined and uh, and more um, others sharing the, you know just very grateful for sharing your experiences um, and uh, comments here but lots of very supportive uh, comments it was just such a fantastic a session and very informative about uh, not just about um, uh, about Edwards but also about the work of of uh, of the soft uh, charity. Um, we've got a couple of questions and we've got a bit of time, which is great. Um, so I'm just going to go on and have a look at them. So we've uh, the first one is, is probably less of a question, more of a comment. Um, is Lindsay says she looks like your husband, and I'm so sorry that his pants were not handled with more compassion. Um, I bet nobody said congratulations, you had a lovely little girl. Um, okay. I always remember seeing a little one with her parents aged about 10 in a large pushchair with auction, but all with big smiles. Um, and interestingly, almost every picture you had there had Isabel smiling and, you know, I'm pleased to hear about you saying that our, our bossiness shines through. She might have, she's able to communicate absolutely in many ways so it sounds like she's uh, she's able to do that <laughs> very well um and uh, Lindsay goes on to say uh you know about the peds muttering um and that uh, that we just need to understand the daughter's need for love um so just quite powerful there chris has asked about whether it would be appropriate to join the organization or the support groups with the likes of trisomy 21 support groups are there enough similarities in the parents needs or is the feeling that the, the, the support that parents of trisomy 18 and trisomy 13 are quite distinct? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, and I think, I think in many ways, the experiences of the trisomy 21 community are sort of like, feel like they're about 30 years ahead of the experiences of um, the 18 and 13 um, community in the way that um, sort of language is used and the, um, the sort of, expectations and the sort of more balanced kind of um, approach. Well, I say I think that um, I have come across people who've had a, a, a Downs diagnosis who've had actually a very similar experience to the kind of way that our, our news was, was, was given. So um, I think um, I think it's really quite tricky. We do do a lot of um, we do have a lot of conversations with Trisomy 21 groups and there have been things and um, so for instance when we we um, uh, we did some training um, when um, and it was starting to be talked about the NIPT um, testing, mm -hmm. yep. some joint work with Down syndrome on uh, on that. So we so we work pretty closely um, with the Downs um, associations, but I think I think they are two rather different situations at the moment. In that, typically the um, although we have a very very positive story, and many do. Many trisomy eighteen and thirteen babies don't make it at the moment, and so the the sort of needs are quite diverse within our community, mm -hmm. and probably the needs in the Downs community are quite diverse too. But the, and there's overlap in the middle, but there's probably ends where the needs are quite different. I would I would yeah. think. So, so I yeah. think, but certainly sharing resources and communicating and and, and um, 
yeah we, we certainly do that as soft and as individual parents as well fantastic and certainly that's coming through in some of the chat comments as well about the fact that often obstetricians and neonatologists don't seem to have the the most up-to-date understanding their, their perceptions of of diagnosis of trisomy 13 and 18 is as you've described that yeah. that's effectively incompatibility with life and and that yeah. thinking doesn't seem to have um always came came on and so i wonder if if your thoughts are that there's perhaps something that needs to be done in, from an education perspective and the medical education to to refresh that even if it's postgraduate education what should is there been opportunities to link in there absolutely and i think it's so important um uh so important because it's still happening you it's easy to think our story's out of date because our diagnosis was 10 years ago but actually parents parents someone i was speaking to yesterday had had exactly the same experience um but hers was a pregnancy diagnosis rather than um, uh, a birth one so it's it's still the same um although there are people getting a better experience now it's it's it, it's patchy so um, we are trying very hard, and 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 certainly um, uh, we're 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 bookable for um, uh, for talks. Uh, I do one with. So I noticed when we were in hospital um, with Isabel um, when she was poorly that the doctors would tend to bring medical consult medical students round and yep. have a chat to us, and and that was great. But it was not always the time that we wanted to talk no. to someone. Um, partly because she's not looking at it but you, you want to say look this is this brilliant child and she's thriving doing very well and there she is like on oxygen and sort of like all like confirming everything that they originally yeah. so, um so i have a regular um session with fourth year students at exeter where i go and do a workshop with them about um uh trisomy 18 um okay. but that's a locally that's our um consultant who's who's got me engaged locally mm -hmm. and we're trying to do other things Sort of locally but but if anybody um wants to make contact with soft and book um a trustee or some resources or something that would help uh, in your local communities um we would be very happy to do that we're oh, yeah. we're a very tiny charity um and so um uh so any links any any sort of um opportunities to come and help help just talk it through it's not i'm not painting the picture that everyone's going to have a rosy experience no. Um, ours is typical but I think the self-fulfilling prophecy issue is a concern. Absolutely um, we've just got another couple of minutes so I'm going to try and squeeze in a couple more questions one from Chris Warren about is esophageal atresia common in trisomy 18 is that a common um, issue? Well that's a good question um, uh, and it is one of the things that can happen but it can also equally happen quite commonly without trisomy 18 mm -hmm. so um, uh, so when we were in bristol waiting for surgery there were two other babies at the same time without trisomy also waiting for the same surgery mm -hmm. so um so so it has um uh, i don't know if anyone has mapped the incidence in trisomy 18 compared to the general population that is certainly one of the things that i know other parents have experienced because people have asked us our specific questions about that so. Good. Great, thank you. And final question, um, just before we finish, when coming, Jennifer Reed writes, when coming across anomalies or concerns with pregnancy, I've always wanted to err on the side of hope, but I've questioned if it is right to give hope to parents. Would you prefer that professionals sit on the fence rather than give only the negatives, or should we, should we actually be trying to be realistically hopeful? It's really difficult. I think having all hope squash out, squashed out of you is the bleakest and most desperate position ever. And when that happened to us, or when that that seemed to be the case in our diagnosis, that I can't explain how bleak that place was. I think at the same time, being realistic um, and, um, and saying, well, actually, um, this might lead to um, a bad outcome, but there are things we can do if that's the case. Um, I think it's always important um, to look at the symptoms, not just the syndrome. So if a trisomy 18 um, baby is showing up in a scan as having serious symptom issues that are going to lead to it being less likely to being a positive outcome, then that is worth talking about as well as if they don't. I think that that's important too, but I think hope is important. I think some hope 
um uh it's um hope is um hope isn't a real thing like hope so so false hope isn't a real thing either um it's hope is sometimes what keeps you going and what makes you think oh it's worth getting out of bed tomorrow um uh it's it's um so i think my personal preference is to err on the side of hope but but also you know sharing sharing what's actually going on um but um but i think doing i think that we don't know i think that that quote that our um consultant gave us that you know statistics are there but actually this is your child and it, they can't predict what's going to happen to your child i think it was really empowering for us absolutely well i think that's a very inspiring point to finish on Alison. thank you very much thank for you. sharing sharing your and isabel and your family story um i'm sure the the website and the charity will be getting lots of traffic now from college um, and wish you all the best. So thank you very much indeed and thank you. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.